Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Marie McCauley from the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning in Hamburg. Thank you for being here, everybody. And uh, today's webinar is the 12th webinar in our uh, webinar thematic series uh, as part of the Global Network of Learning Cities. And today we'll be talking about new partnerships in education governance in the context of COVID-19. Uh, just a few quick uh, logistics um, for today. So the, hour, the webinar will be an hour long as opposed to an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, one of our uh, speakers is not able to join, so we'll be sticking to uh, the typical format. The webinar is recorded as uh, every week and uh, will be available on the YouTube channel um, for UIL, which uh, a link uh, will be provided for in the chat for everybody to have. Uh, the format for today's webinar is similar to that of last week's and um, for those of you who were not with us, so we have individual presentations by the different speakers followed by a brief uh, one, one or two questions um, to clarify any particular point, but um, a Q&A session all the way at the end of all the different uh, interventions. Uh, and we take questions from the Q&A. So for that, we ask that all of the participants in the audience, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen and not the chat when you ask questions. That way, uh, you have multiple options uh, here. You can write your own question. If there's a question that somebody's already asked that you really like, you can like that question. The more likes, the further up the question goes into the queue, and we'll be make sure to ask those questions uh, if, if you agree with those specifically. Um, so again, please use the Q&A throughout the whole session. Um, if you have a specific question for a specific speaker, you can definitely write in the, in the question that you're asking that this question is related to the presentation by a certain speaker. Now, the audience is fully muted, so you're not able to speak to us. Um, so if you have uh, something you'd like to share, content, etc., you can definitely use the chat for that, uh, but not for the questions, please. And uh, uh, two little announcements to make before we get started. Today, um, I'm letting you know that the period for membership applications to the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities is uh, extended. Cities have the possibility to apply until June 30th, 2020 and national commissions have until July 31st, 2020 to endorse the procedure. All of the different uh, information, including the membership application forms, uh, are available using the link that's provided to you in the chat right now. Also, if you just go to our website and uh, Learning Cities, you'll be able to find the needed information. And lastly, I want to share with you uh, the possibility of Learning Cities, as well as other stakeholders, joining the UNESCO social media campaign, hashtag learning never stops. The campaign gathers one minute videos from students, parents and teachers about how they are dealing with COVID-19 school closures. Everyone can participate by posting a video on their social media channels by tagging at UNESCO and at UIL, uh, while also submitting a consent form to the headquarters in regards to the use of the video for the campaign's purposes. So just so you know, hashtag learning never stops. And now moving on to today. Uh, this webinar specifically. So we have speakers from all over the world, uh, starting with uh, Ms. Hara Hoeflich de Duque, Director of UCLG Learning, the Uni United Cities and Local Governments, uh, followed by a presentation by Ms. Julie Reddy, the Deputy CEO of the South African Qualifications Authority. Uh, joining us as well is Mr. Moon Seok Jin, Mayor of Sodemongu in uh, the Republic of Korea, and also a member of the UNESCO Global Network. Uh, learning cities, and uh, Mr. Jesus Mateo uh, from the Department of Education in the Philippines will be providing uh, remarks. And uh, with that, I will pass the floor to our opening address for today from our colleague at the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, uh, Mr. Alexander Howells. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the topic of today's webinar is uh, new partnerships in education governance. So, um, as we all know, lifelong learning involves all areas of life, including health, work, environment, justice, family, citizenship and culture. National ministries, local governments, private stakeholders, cultural institutions and civil society all have important roles to play in integrating lifelong learning into the daily lives of citizens and in ensuring their learning demands are met. The coordinated promotion of lifelong learning therefore relies on partnerships between stakeholders in a cross-sectoral approach to education governance, which is advantageous at the national level, but also the local level. 
Indeed, in cities, the greater proximity between stakeholders can aid the cultivation of collaborative efforts. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, cities worldwide were finding diverse ways of engaging partners in the learning of local people through community learning centers, learning festivals, and other inspiring initiatives. And now in the context of COVID-19, the cross-sectoral governance of education has taken on a new significance with partnerships forged in a matter of days and weeks. In countries and cities around the world, we've seen um, formal education move online with schools ceding some responsibility for provision uh, to online learning providers and parents. With vulnerable groups facing difficulties in accessing online learning, new partnerships with businesses and technology companies have helped munis municipalities extend internet coverage and access to devices uh, in a relatively short space of time. Meanwhile, higher education institutions have transitioned to online learning while contributing to new partnerships beyond traditional courses and traditional programs. Uh, we've seen institutions implement open access courses for adults and harness the expertise of their faculties of medicine to conduct health awareness campaigns uh, and contribute towards medical advancements to counter the virus. Adult education has been further aided by the opening up of previously restricted learning resources by businesses, digital providers, uh, libraries and universities. All these new partnerships and adaptations signal an immediate shift in education governance, but they will also have a long term effect as more stakeholders work together to facilitate educational provision. Today we'll gain insights into how this is happening by hearing from representatives at the national and the local level. So uh, welcome everybody, thank you for joining us uh, and back to Marie. Thank you and uh, without further ado we'll start with our first speaker for today, uh, Ms. Uh, Sarah Hoflisch. Sarah, I will upload your slides right now and you're welcome to get started as soon as you're ready. And let's make sure we can hear you before that happens and now you can speak. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Raul, and all the network of uh, UNESCO uh, learning cities. Uh, to be here for us is, is uh, really nice. It's really important because we, um, we are uh, at UCLG, we are the main voice of, of the local governments. Um, I see you uploaded directly uh, the slides. Nine, but uh, Christine, so I, it doesn't matter. I will just uh, give an introduction before coming to the points we found out. Um, UCLG is um, is a main network of cities and local governments. We are also the voice in the United Nations, and we gather the political leadership of local, local governments. But, uh, we also, of course, uh, connect to other areas. So yeah. if I'm Director of Learning. This means this is one of other of four areas. The areas are policy, advocacy, research, and learning. And in my area, uh, sorry to yeah. interrupt you. Just your microphone. We're getting a lot of feedback from it. Uh, I don't know if you're close to it or you're touching it. If you could just try to not touch it, maybe it'll help. We're just you, we can hear you really yeah. clearly and sometimes not so clearly. Okay, so you can go to the slide uh, number seven and we take it from there. Yeah, oh. so there before you saw some insights on the on UCLG, here we come uh, to what learning means. And just because we, uh, um, the connection uh, of the learning department with learning cities is uh, too uh, in interesting in two ways. One, of course, we connect those who provide capacity to local governments. And uh, in the, so us, the most important point in learning is actually the demand and the charging local government offices that are uh, very important to connect to life of learning opportunities. And we always look for partners and, and university, or we also uh, in the United Nations, we look and how this knowledge and how this political motivation can be delivered. So one piece is uh, the localizing of the that was very much our agenda in the last two years. And then in the next slide, when we come now to uh, what COVID means actually and what is changing, we can say uh, uh, 
in Barcelona, this is uh, our, the hosting city of our organization, um, we saw that it's very important to our thousands of uh, municipal leaders and also the association of the government to connect each other to learn. Of course, uh, the cities are already connected because there is a lot of decentralized cooperation going on. On decentralized cooperation, this is all subnational government uh, cooperation, and much of this co cooperation is actually also involving schools. But when we saw the pandemic is coming, we needed to connect our leaders. So we did 15 uh, learning exercises up to now. Every week we meet leaders in three languages and um, give them the opportunity to exchange and to look on what are their important practices, where do they want to learn from, and what is um, the highlight in their own agenda. So, this is also uh, meaningful because the COVID pandemic is, of course, changing everything, but uh, the basis remain the same. So we work under the umbrella of the SDG and the global agendas, but we are adjusting and uh, finding maybe a new pragmatism. So if I can uh, go a little bit into the points that are said here. Sarah, I'm sorry. Your sound is really good at times, really bad other times. I don't oh, know. If, I don't. Oh, sorry. Do, no, it's, it's my okay. computer. I don't move. Okay. Can you go back to the slide? I uh, that was uh, before. Let's just, if you don't mind, I'm just going to remove your video and see if that makes things better. Okay. Okay. This your webcam. I'm going to take it, turn it off, and and we'll see if that the sound is better. Otherwise, I think uh, we'll. I don't know. We'll, let's see how this goes. Okay. Is better now. I will see. It just comes in and out. Sometimes it's okay. clear, sometimes No, so sorry. Can you go back to the points? Uh, because this, these were the findings of our LLE exercise, which I think is very important. In particular here, I would like to address what is, has uh, relation with education. So the first point is public So we need to be aware that it's an enormous cost maintenance of public service do you know don't you hear me half and half it's really bad is there any chance you could either connect on your phone and we'll just you can start again uh just uh with it through a different device just because it gets incredibly choppy and we don't know what you're saying anymore let me try now is it better well right now it's perfect i'm just hopeful okay. that it's staying that way oh, sorry oh no I'm so sorry yeah so i i now uh, switched the device so um did you hear anything of the presentation or should i start uh, i think you can start again if that's okay for everybody's sake oh, yes so sorry okay shall we just so move back to the top is that okay yeah okay so we rushed to a very fast introduction to united cities and local governments we are the voice of local governments in the United Nations. Our, our please continue. Our, our membership is usually of a thousand cities, but mainly we have 140 associations. So this means 70% of local government. So this is important because it makes us the voice of local governments worldwide. Uh, we, we didn't hear that again. It stopped. Can you continue now? Yeah, no, but I think okay. it, you're, you're just coming in and out. We really just can't hear you when you're speaking. Um, is there any way you could log off and log back in and we'll just move on to the next presentation and start up again with it. If you can try okay. changing a device altogether or connecting with the phone. And yeah. We can. Okay? Yeah. We'll just we'll 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 just for you'll just move on to the next uh we'll move on to the next presentation and you'll just come right okay. after that. Okay. So I try by phone to connect, okay? Please, thank you so much. Okay, so we'll uh, I'm sorry about the technical difficulties, everybody. I think we can uh, move on to our next speaker for now. Um, so we'll give the floor to the mayor of Sodemangu, Mr. Moon Sok Jin, for his presentation on uh, governance, uh, new partnerships and governance in education in the context of uh, Sodemangu, a city in the Republic of Korea. And I will be uploading your slides. Uh, first, uh, welcome, Mr. Moon Sok Jin. Can you hear us? And um, 
let's just make sure you are you are muted at the moment. Let me just unmute you and see if we can hear you there. You should be able yeah. to see now. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sok Jin Moon, the mayor of uh, Sodemungu, Seoul, South Korea. I hope all of you are well in the midst of the global pandemic. I would like to share the experiences uh, of Korea and my city, Sodemungu, with you in regard to new governance and the partnerships in education after COVID-19. Uh, let me start with the current uh, status of COVID-19 in Korea. South Korea currently has uh, 11,110 uh, confirmed COVID-19 cases in Korea as of uh, today. Uh, also, we have uh, relatively well responded uh, to the threat of the coronavirus. The COVID-19 has caused a significant impact in all kinds of social systems in Korea, not just including the quarantine system, but also uh, political, economical, and even cultural system. Uh, the education community is also going through big changes in the face of uh, the unprecedented online opening school. I will tell you what is going on in schools and uh, other education programs in Sodemungu after the COVID-19 breakout. As in other regions, uh, conventional face-to-face -face education was interrupted in schools and educational institutions and has been largely converted to online education. Therefore, the governments has continued to postpone uh, the opening of the schools, uh, leading to gradual reopening after a period of uh, uh, online school opening. Teachers and the students are now meeting online every day, not in the school classroom. Today was the first day of a physical reopening of a school only for high school seniors. Even when schools are reopened, strict social distancing life policies applied nationwide. So all students need to maintain a certain distance to other students and teachers. Wearing masks during the class is compulsory. Social distancing is for residents who are worried about lack of experiences or exercise in the aftermath of the COVID-19 infection. Hong Jae-chan working alone challenge is being held. It is often seen that the residents of Sodemungu working through Hong Jae-chan alone to keep their health while practicing the distance in their lives in Sodemungu. Next, I am going to explain various measures taken to ensure the sustainability of school and other education in Sodemungu. We are doing a number of projects to keep local residents safe and to guarantee people's right to study. First of all, we have been supporting IT devices and uh, wireless network equipment to schools for facilitating the smooth online opening of schools. Not all students or their families want the pieces or other IT devices necessary for online school. So we have provided table, uh, tablet PC and notebook and Wi-Fi support uh, to the less fortunate students. City government also helped the building of media rooms in schools with its one budget in order to establish an online learning system. Also, we have dispatched teaching assistant to strengthen the online teaching ability of our school teachers. For the establishment of a future-oriented learning center, a committee was formed with experts in the related fields. The committee is discussing education policies to respond to COVID-19 
I will give you a bit more details later. Besides, Sodemo has been giving subsidy to uh, private free schools, classes, and the teaching centers for financial relief, which has ceased their operation since the COVID-19 breakout. Education policy related to primary and secondary education in South Korea is mainly under the authority of the national government. Uh, each Metropolitan Office of Education takes responsibility to provide resources and manage the school system. Thus, individual local governments have no direct authority on public education system, which makes us become more creative to help students in time of crisis. Distribution of a career experience kit is a good example. This kit is specially designed to help young people explore their career options. So then we we'll began to make this kit and to distribute students and the parents like it much and it is considered as an alternative to on-site learning. This creative approach started by my city opens on new types of uh, learning experiences for students beyond the curricula of public schools. In addition, Sodemo has offered a variety of online classes for its residents, for example, uh, free online line dance classes and online live coverage of uh, Sodemo's children's social uh, soccer teams. It helps locals participate in the untech physical activities. I would like to talk about the creation of a new governance and educational partnerships after COVID-19, which will be the core of our today's presentation. Currently, COVID-19 is called the 21st century Black Death and has changed everything around us. Experts predict that the changes will still continue even after COVID-19 ends. But do these changes caused by COVID-19 have only negative aspects? Looking back to man's history, opportunities have always emerged in crisis. If we try to find an answer to a problem together, we can always come up with solution. That is why Sodemo is also trying to overcome this difficult situation through the partnerships with schools, universities, expert groups, and the life institutions. First type of a partnership is a between local governments and education office. So then when the social Western District Office of Education promised the efforts to brief up remote learning systems, we signed the MOU which led to another collaboration to help students in the low-income households. So they provided financial support of a, a 2.6 billion won uh, US dollar, uh, 2 million uh, dollars equivalent for tablet piece and the notebook purchase and the wireless network construction to 40 uh, local schools. This support was implemented through the uh, Western District Office of Education and the huge help for schools and uh, the less fortunate students. This audacious measure was the first among Korean local governments for including the less privileged students who has no IT resources for online classes. As there are nine universities in Sodebungu city, universities are also the main partners in network building. Two projects are underway now. With the Seoul National University, we are developing programs for the student of citizenship and the capacity building of future teachers. Master students studying adult education are organized into two groups to work with faculty member for program development. Through the project, so then when the, the group are discussing post-corona education methods, educational content, 
and the required uh, capabilities of our teachers. Mr. Munsuk, you just have yeah. one, one minute left. Okay, okay. Yeah, I will read. Uh, and the other is uh, the expert groups. Partnership between local governments and expert groups are another key factor since COVID-19 and networks with expert groups have also become very important as educational paradigm changes. So we created the COMIT group and uh, we will uh, uh, have uh, the group meeting uh, against uh, the, uh, this uh, COVID-19 problems. And uh, we will have uh, the, uh, uh, with uh, the experts, we'll have uh, the good uh, plan uh, against uh, the, uh, after the cor uh, coronavirus. Uh, and uh, we selected uh, 11 experts uh, on future technology contents through the open recruitment and sent them to schools. Partnership between local governments and the lifelong learning organizations were also important. A good example is the support from the National Institute for Lifelong Education and Seoul Metropolitan Institute for Lifelong uh, Education. In order to discuss the right path of uh, the education policy in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, local government, the education office, schools, lifelong educational institutions and individual instructors gathered together and discussed about what would be the best way to safeguard the learning environment. COVID-19 will not end easily, and even if it does, a new and more powerful virus could hit us again. But just as the Renaissance showed us a literary revival after the catastrophe of a Black Death, so I believe uh, we will overcome and uh, uh, we will uh, make uh, the breakthrough in the crisis of uh, COVID-19. Uh, so we will continue to take the initiative and make the efforts to collaborate with partners across the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank, Mr. You. Thank yeah. you for the time. I know it's a bit mm. tricky. Uh, because we're running out of time and we got a little bit delayed starting, I won't ask you a question now. We'll just move to the Q&A session Thank later you. at the end. Uh, yeah. So we'll move back to our previous speaker, Sarah Hofrich. Uh, hopefully we can hear you. And I see you've changed the device. We see you now again differently. Uh, so I'll be uploading your slides. Let's just start again, if that's OK. I think everybody will appreciate the introduction. Uh, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. And it's better now. Yeah, I can hear you very well now. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, I would like to. Um, I think the points the mayor uh, um, did of Sud Sudamungu were very relevant, and we find them uh, confirmed in many of our membership at United Cities and local governments. So we, UCLG, are uh, the largest local government organization. We have um, uh, more than 1,500 direct members, but mainly all the local government associations are our members. So this means we have a very important representativity uh, in the United Nations uh, for local governments and mayors. Maybe you can quickly go to the first uh, slides. I think this I have already said. Uh, the next one uh, shows a little bit how we usually work. And um, of course, all these meetings we do, uh, please, please uh, remain a moment. Um, yeah, we work in uh, four angles. One angle is uh, learning, but the other angles, advocacy is the main, uh, our main task uh, we do because we are the main a uh, recognized agency in the United Nations. We also coordinate all, all cities' networks through something we call Global Task Force. We do research and we do learning. What is the point on learning in UCLG? Uh, this is mostly because uh, when we work with mayors, local governments, they all ask us, we need also access to capacity building, we need cooperation, we need partnership. So learning looks a little bit on this, looks on decentralized cooperation. There is a lot between cities uh, sharing lessons, learning from each other. 
looks how we enable um, this this um, transfer of knowledge and uh, we also look in how to connect the global agenda uh, to the local policy making so if you go uh, next um, this is a little bit an insight how we work we have been in the last years very much focusing on localizing the SDG which is very very important agenda for local governments uh, again local governments are a political entity so uh, in the in this global agenda we are really getting a lot of uh, acknowledgement uh, that local governments are the main implementers of all these global goals and this is of course very important then in the fine tuning nation by nation city by city because this translates in more attention in more funding in more decentralized uh, decentralization and subsidiarity next um if we uh, uh, when the covid uh, crisis please next one uh, uh, hit us and uh, it hit barcelona which is our head office but of course um, it hits all uh, cities in the world our political leaders very quickly said we need to learn from each other we need to see what are you doing and i think again uh, 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 Sudamun Gu is a good example because mayor of Seoul was of course a very important um, source of the city of so uh, Seoul learning from and so uh, the Chinese because uh, there's a lot uh, that others can learn even now when the crisis hits very very hardly Latin America there's a lot of, of uh, horizontal lessons to learn from. So in the next slide, you see what were the main points we found in these learnings and dialogues. Um, and I think that are important. And here we see education coming up a lot, even not in the center, because most of the cities and local government, they don't have uh, uh, competences on, on curricular development or on education and they are forced to implement now I think uh, the big revolution happening in the digitalization of, of education is very important but seldomly uh, the competence of local government so local government are responsible for the service provision and the local servants so this is uh, very important in all the all there's a public servant and then there is a private servant a again when we talk about partnership for example on schools care centers child care centers elderly uh, care this is a lot of private organization uh, ngos or also voluntary services so local government are the ones who take care that this remains functional so uh, because uh, if not it would all uh, fall a little bit apart the confinement also has been um, very important. I think that the point was made by the speaker before. The digital access, uh, it's not the same, neither the digital access, neither the, the easy access to get to into uh, educational, online education. So this um, is a, a risk of, again, uh, hit very hard the vulnerable groups. The communication barriers uh, uh, for the language diversity and the access of information. The cultural concerns, so the cultural sector is the one suffering most. It's really very hardly hit, but on the other uh, side, they also are the ones fighting uh, a lot and, and uh, going very quickly uh, to uh, the new way of, of uh, digital uh, cultural offers. And we say this is the antidote against uh, what the, what the um, uh, crisis also means for mental health, for society, for, for information and, and activity. Then uh, the homeschooling and the childcare task uh, were very uh, were disproportional for women. So women have, uh, of course, uh, they fall into sometimes uh, uh, overwhelming uh, the, that was unknown. So not only the violence, so domestic violence has uh, uh, increase a lot but also the the point of how to care the children if if children are not used to uh, get online the, everybody uh, supposes that there is a mother uh, helping out so that get got a, is a very important piece to to work and um, i already made the point on digital technologies 
and the rights, of course, the right to be protected uh, because we have uh, a digital access. The, the, the way how to deal with digital technologies is, is uh, really very unequal and there's a lot to do um, and to not only to, to access, but also to protect uh, the, the users, the privacies and so on. And uh, finally, the learning and capacity for public service workers. So there, if we go to the next um, slide, that one on the public servant uh, is really our co core concern and we would like to engage much more with your network because we think that all the change that is happening now in education, uh, you mentioned the role of universities. Uh, of course, the uh, universities um, have been responsive together with cities, governments, much more easily on the public than on the private side. But um, uh, other, other uh, services, uh, were the private had, were dealt as it was public service. So um, there is a new discussion about what is a public service and what should be included in the public service. So this is a positive point, we think, uh, the crisis is uh, giving us um, because it is, uh, has gained respect and, and recognition. The resiliency as well, the importance of partnerships. So I think it's really crucial that you call this for, for the way uh, how the different partnership has, uh, can be done. Uh, because we also need to see in particular the educational sector is a very important um, job provider in particular for intermediary cities. So if this all goes very much online, uh, often if, if points are going online, uh, they get centralized. And I would like to know from your side if this is, um, if you have experience on this. So how small educational services and small uh, schools can, can, uh, co can exist and are the same resilience as, as the big ones. And um, of course, the other point, a big problem and we need to overcome is the adequate financing. Uh, uh, um, public, public financing is uh, very important to roll quickly down to local government level, also with the possibility of decision making, because there is a lot of demand for partnership with cooperatives, with, with also with university, with schools, with uh, everybody so local government is an enabler uh, must be an enabler but it must also have the adequate financing to do so so we know in countries like Germany uh, the financing uh, is really already functioning uh, that it is spent uh, this uh, uh, recovery financing by local governments but there are many countries that remain a very centralistic point of view to uh, to the spending and this will of course really limit very much the possibilities of partnerships. One so um, going to the last point then, maybe we can, um, uh, yeah, this was our de Decalogue. I already summarized. Uh, these are the main points we have been finding. And they again uh, confirm the agenda of the uh, global agenda and in particular sustainable development goals as the key to move forward. So uh, next one. Um, yeah, uh, that's I already said, and we go now to the last piece. So uh, this is a little bit in my uh, in our own work. We have now the challenge to also um, what we had done uh, peer to peer learning formats, uh, our meetings. All this has to change. So we need to to improve and to adapt uh, our formats, uh, and we need to see how we can remain the attention to, again, uh, local servants, because uh, the, our experience beforehand was that the local servants, as they are usually very overhand and very stressed, they had a lot of difficulties uh, to follow the usual digital um, learning offers. And we need to be inventive because lifelong learning is so important for so many local governments. Imagine uh, all the villages in Africa that have to face. So people work with very, very badly paid. They, they work with big, big difficulties. They um, have no opportunities, sometimes difficulties even with internet. So we need to 
uh, reinvent also uh, our our learning and um, of course be quite personalized uh, with the new formats. So this is uh, my contribution. I hope I could stick to the time and sorry for the sound problems of the first moment. This is super. Thank you, Sarah. We heard you loud and clear this time around, and I'm glad that we started again from the beginning. Uh, it was a really interesting presentation, and to hear uh, that you've identified the key challenges, especially in the context of cities, uh, this is very relevant to the topic of our work and to what we do every day. Uh, we, I'd like to just ask you one really quick question before we move on to, um, to the next. There's quite a few questions that have come in, but generally speaking, you've mentioned quite a few challenges that uh, cities and, and the public sector will have to tackle. Uh, has UCLG started developing or, or looking into some framework for action for next steps following the, the COVID-19? Yeah, thank you very much, Maureen, for this question. Um, the Decalogue is, um, if you will read it, uh, it is a very positive document. So we really try to see um, uh, not, not only the losses, which are <laughs> huge you know i mean uh, 250 million jobs and and uh, but uh, we we try to see positively what do we do now with this new uh, angle so uh, the the way of action and and our our will be to enlarge the work much more with partners than we did before because we see the new era and and uh, meetings like the one we have now uh, gives a new chance to work much more horizontally. And um, we also see that uh, we, all, of course, have to a little bit um, to, uh, to be pragmatic, in particular, the role of local governments and the keys. So if you want public service, the public service has to be financed. And this means in every single village, in every single municipality, in every single city, much more work for the uh, association and we also will develop another agenda addition to the SDG we will look much more into the resilience because we have uh, learned from the crisis this is a sanitary crisis but a uh, crisis occur in all fields and we uh, need that the cities the networks the understanding of resilience goes much further and much broader than uh, it was in the past uh, relating to natural disasters only. So the resilience and the solidarity, uh, that will be two pieces uh, we will emphasize in the year to come and we are very happy to share and, and work together with you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. for that answer. Uh, also for uh, just generally the, the, the tone that you're adopting is very much one that we're, we're looking to adopt as well and next steps on the topic of solidarity and resilience. So I can, I can foresee work with the network on, on that particular topic. So thank you. It's a great opportunity. Um, we'll move on to our speaker. We're uh, a little short on time. So um, let's transition smoothly to our colleague from South Africa. So we'll, we'll have moved from Korea, Spain to South Africa now. Uh, Ms. Julie Reddy from uh, Deputy CEO uh, of the South African, um, uh, remind me of the, f I think Qualifications Authority. Thank you, Qualifications Authority, exactly. Uh, so I'll share your screen, your um, presentation right now and the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie. Uh, and apologies for joining late. We have, um, we have technology, we have the, the devices, we don't have connectivity in South Africa, so it's the biggest challenge. Okay, well, welcome. I'm glad you're with us. Good, thank you. All right, uh, my brief was to talk about uh, this concept about working across pac uh, practice boundaries in response to COVID-19, the pandemic in South Africa, and specifically to focus on schooling and adult education, which is what I will do. Um, I think many countries are doing this intuitively, so it's not a new concept. But just to say that working across practice boundaries doesn't just happen intuitively, unfortunately. There needs to be a very, um, I think, uh, defined and considered process to work across practice boundaries. And I think one of the key tenets of that is for people to, to be very honest about where are the centers of intersecting practice and what does it mean to leave your own agendas aside. So I'll just speak a little bit about that in the South African context. 
Okay, so the, con the concept was introduced to us by a professor at Oxford University, Anne Edwards, uh, and we've been working with this thing, um, with this concept, relational agency, and one of the key tenants you will see is that although it respects history, it's focused on working across your own practice boundaries uh, with a view to creating common knowledge and getting a shared understanding and understanding the different motives of others in collaborating and moving forward. And no way is this most needed than in this dealing with the pandemic in our various countries and our, uh, our different contextual realities. Um, it involves the sharing and acknowledging of specialized knowledge and skills, um, and it involves understanding and engaging with the motives of others and leaving our particular agendas and egos aside, which sometimes is hard to do. Um, it can be used vertically and horizontally. So there are authority hierarchies, power relationships, as I am experiencing now, and then horizontally across units and organizations, but it's a very holistic approach. Uh, in, in looking at this concept, it ensures that you involve everybody. So how does it relate to South Africa? I just want to say up front that we haven't uh, officially adopted this concept, but the way we're working shows that this concept is embedded. And one of the things we have found at SACWA with using this over the years it's very linked to the African concept of Ubuntu that we've used for many, many years. And as is very often in African countries, it was never ever given a term or definition. I mean, it's there, we've used it, but you know, it wasn't written in a lot of papers, it is now. So what has happened? In South Africa, I was just you know, saying that we entered stage five lockdown from 27th March. Uh, we're now in stage four, and we're moving towards stage three. So we've been in lockdown um, for six weeks now. And at the end of May, it will be eight weeks. But some of us have been in self-isolation even before that, when the first case was reported in South Africa. So the, our president, uh, his whole principle and underlying philosophy is to save lives, not necessarily a total focus on the economy. And that for a country like South Africa is a very brave decision given our high unemployment and uh, our problems where, you know, we have a very uh, triple threat of poverty, unemployment, uh, and those kinds of things. So the president immediately established an advisory committee, the National Council, and widely consulted with all those different entities, but he's very, very informed by the, the reports from the, the scientific world in terms of dealing with this pandemic in our country. So the decisions are guided by extensive consultation with all these stakeholders, as well as international organizations. And so far he's doing almost weekly or bi-weekly briefings. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Um, also it involves our Ministry of Health working in collaboration with our national health laboratory service and community health workers, especially in regards to the rollout testing and screening. And we get daily figures that are sent to us of how many people tested, how many new, um, you know, how many new cases have been uncovered. Uh, our death rate has been kept very, very low, under 300 in this country, while we gear up to, you know, to deal with rising infection rates. Uh, the, the president also immediately set up the Solidarity Fund to support our response, and we have raised a fair amount of money to feed the people in our country, because with this pandemic and the closure of our businesses and the complete lockdown of our country, as Sarah has said, our economy has really taken a beat. And, you know, unemployment and poverty levels so while we might save lives, we are, we are very aware that people might die from starvation and hunger. And that's a big crisis we are facing. All right, in terms of schooling and adult education, uh, they were closed in terms of the national state of disaster and the lockdown regulations. Um, but both, we have two departments. Our basic education department deals with schooling 
and our higher education and training department deals with post-schooling. And they have made firm commitments about the continuity of education. Next slide, please. Uh, all right. In terms of schooling, uh, you know, uh, continuity of schooling, they were the way our country has dealt with it. Online schooling provision is ongoing. However, it is very uneven. We have uh, people in rural and marginal communities who don't have the same access as people in the cities and urban areas. So partnerships have been formed to try to offer comprehensive learner support packages. Uh, understanding our particular context and the unevenness of our society and provisioning. And you will note that the support is divided into six areas. So all of those, but very clearly safety, health and safety issues and those kinds of considerations are very important. Uh, I was in a meeting this morning where they said, it's not social dis uh, distancing, but more we're looking at social solidarity and individual distancing trying to make that distinction in our deliberations. Um, this collaboration has already yielded very positive outcomes and we're dealing with both uh, cooperating and dealing with both international and local organizations and our media companies like the South African Broadcasting Corporation, SABC and DSTV and other you know, network agencies are very much in, on board but we're working very much with civil society who can go into the rural areas and deal with social issues uh, you know, in those communities. So what I've said there is relational expertise and agency is a very good organizing principle to achieve a common goal. The next slide. All right, just to say that last night, before I go into these details, our Minister of Basic Education announced that the schools will reopen on the 1st of June. We have a very differentiated approach where national instructions are then drilled down to provincial instructions and then there's a local response. So not, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. It depends very particularly on context and where the, the schools are placed in our country. So in adult education, there is one minute left, Julie. Okay. The resumption of teaching and learning to be staggered. And you know, we're re-looking at our academic calendar. We're trying to get people, uh, you know, adults ready to write the examinations, and we're looking at October, November to do to do this. And we are looking at all the partners like faith-based churches, organizations to help in the adult education field. So also relational agency is important, yeah. Next slide. Okay, uh, there are a few slides. We will share it with people, but I won't go into the details. So what does it mean to work across practice boundaries? The challenge is, uh, you know, all of this relates to working with complex problems. So what is the core ideas of relational expertise, relational agency? It's to build common knowledge and work across boundaries. We need to identify where the site of intersecting practice, and we know this is the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and then if you drill down to schooling and then adult education, and then we build and use common knowledge in these areas. Next slide. Okay, uh, these practices are shaped and taken forward by the motives as, I, as I've explained earlier, and they shape how we interpret the problem. In building common language, uh, we need to look at what matters for each practice and it requires collaboration. I think I'll just go to the last one, uh, Marie, and you can share the other slides because the, the steps are there. So the key principles, this is my last slide, is I think people need to know how to listen. They need to know how to understand and, uh, other people's point of view, and they must learn to represent uh, I need to learn to represent myself to the world and others as you see him. So a key tenant is learning to understand and meaningful comprehension. And it is a moral con uh, conversation that we are facing. So I thought this was very important to respect and learn to respect other people's views and insights when you're dealing in this corporate arrangement where you're crossing boundary practices. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you for uh, sticking to the time as well, Julie. Uh, really interesting presentation and uh, appreciate having that kind of theoretical background to, to, to get a better sense of how the, the hierarchical uh, aspects can all function together. Um, maybe a really quick question before we move on to our next uh, presentation, but you referred to, um, to different collaboration partnerships that have been developed uh, in, the, in the context of COVID-19. Do you picture one or many that will endure uh, post-pandemic? Um, yeah, I think our country, you know, in our country, given the various challenges and the, I think the economic crisis that we're facing will mean that, you know, all these different collaborations and partnerships will have to, uh, you know, continue to work to, to build up our economy again. Uh, it's going to need uh, individual contributions and then, you know, organizational contributions. For example, just in my organization, the decision was taken that nobody will get any kind of recognition bonuses and salaries, or even we might curtail our salary increases so that we can put a contribution in the solidarity fund so that we can, you know, uh, not have people starving in our country. So, you know, those kinds of collaborations and co corporations for the greater good is an ongoing conversation in our country. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Without further ado, we'll transition uh, to our last speaker for today. Uh, we have Mr. Jesus Mateo joining us from the Philippines and a colleague as well, uh, Jostado San Antonio, who is also with us. Um, Mr. Mateo, I think the floor is yours and you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning to those who are in the East Coast. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening here in the Philippines. Uh, it will. I don't have a presentation, but uh, right now we're preparing for the uh, opening of process. We're lucky that uh, it's summer break, no? But then again, as the secretary said, education must continue, and therefore we need to prepare for that eventuality. Normally, the opening of classes is uh, June, but because of this pandemic, we adjusted it to August 24 based on the risk categories provided for by the Interagency Committee uh, Task Force on COVID. Um, well, just to put into context, no? uh, in the context of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the concern really is over basic education, uh, the magnitude of moving and congregating learners, teachers, and education personnel if we will operate in a traditional way. Um, just to give uh, some sort of a background, basic education directly accounts for nearly 30 million individuals, not counting the ancillary services supporting education. So there are about uh, 27.7 million uh, K-12 uh, learners, including ALS, about 900 teachers and personnel. So which means this represents about 27.8% of the estimated 108 million uh, Philippine population. Um, in summary, of the uh, 20 COVID-19 picture beyond 2015 in relation to our sector, uh, definitely the full containment is not yet a thing, given that the Philippine projections and the fact that the pandemic is still uh, raging. This, this means suspension of face-to-face -face classes will remain to be mandatory in areas categorized as uh, moderate and high risks based uh, on the Department of Health's risk severity grading. However, the Interagency Task Force and the Office of the President uh, can make a more aggressive mobility restriction under the executive order. In low-risk areas where face-to-face -face classes may be allowed, you can observe physical distancing, uh, which, which is uh, required, no? including um, uh, observation of the minimum health standards. In the low risk areas, while it may uh, experience outbreak resurgence anytime, this would require suspension of classes. So having those uh, uh, in mind, the Department of Education prepared the basic education learning continuity plan. Uh, this was developed to provide guidance to the department on how to deliver education in this time of crisis, while ensuring that health, safety and welfare of all learners, teachers, and personnel 
of DepEd is guaranteed. Uh, the process by which we took this basic, uh, developed this basic education learning continuity plan uh, is uh, based on the part participatory approach, no? meaning uh, inputs came from our different units. It came from the Philippine Forum for Inclusive Basic Education, which is participated in by multilateral bilateral agencies, including non-government and civil society organizations. Aside from that, we took advice from the chairperson of the both houses of uh, Congress. We also undertook an uh, online survey um, for teachers and learners as well to tell us, uh, to give us an idea of when classes should begin, what kind of modalities we should undertake. The basic principles of the learning continuity plan is firstly to protect the health and safety and well-being of our learners, as I've said earlier. Number two, uh, principle is to ensure learning continuity uh, through the adjustment of the curriculum, the K-12 uh, curriculum, the alignment of all materials, the implementation of multiple learning delivery modalities. Third, to facilitate the safe return of the learners as well as uh, uh, DepEd personnel, Department of Education personnel. We have to be sensitive as well to equity consideration. As made mentioned by earlier um, speakers, uh, internet connection here in the Philippines is not uh, constant. No? There are areas where there are inter uh, internet uh, connection is uh, really, really challenging. That's why we're looking at uh, uh, television and radio as a modality. Um, so in terms of uh, given that, um, we look at the learning modalities uh, in four ways, no? the face-to-face, -face, the distance learning, the blended learning, and the homeschooling. Now, since we have this, um, uh, what you call the basic education uh, learning uh, continuity plan, we ensure that all the stakeholders are involved in the implementation of such. No? Uh, in fact, the basic education learning continuity plan, while uh, it is a guide, the regional offices and the other field offices will have to put their um, uh, hands together uh, to implement and contextualize the learning continuity plan. Having said this, uh, part of our program is really the what we call the Balik Escuela program, which is an annual thing. But this time it will be configured to ensure that we uh, include uh, all the preparatory needs of our schools. No, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, engaging our partners in uh, providing some of the resources needed by our schools and our learners. Example of which is the sanitation of our schools when we open. Um, just to add that some of our schools right now are being used as quarantine areas. But we do discourage the local government units uh, because we want to ensure the safety uh, and health of our learners. The other program that we're looking at uh, is the reconfiguration of the Oplan Barik Escuela which is also an annual activity to ensure that uh, there is a smooth uh, opening of uh, uh, classes. No? So um, I'll, I'll stop there unless you have uh, questions. I hope I have covered uh, how the uh, Philippines is coping with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mateo. Um, I, so I think we've received quite a few questions uh, from, from the participants here in the webinar. Uh, so I'll just, uh, if that's okay, I'll, I'll ask questions to the whole, uh, the whole set of speakers here um, so that everybody can get a chance to answer and just because we're short on time as usual. So um, we'll, we'll use the next few minutes to, um, to, to get uh, through these questions. So one question that has actually gotten quite a lot of likes, um, and by likes I mean uh, people have the option to like a question so that it can get bumped to the top. So. Um, the question comes to us uh, from Sarah Jean Petros, and the question is, what can you suggest in countries um, without enough budget to provide uh, in order to sustain less or low income family of learners uh, to continue learning amidst the current crisis um, that is affecting the education system? So maybe mm -hmm. if you have specific solutions you can point to uh, for, for low income groups and vulnerable groups to continue the learning. I think. Uh, that would be helpful uh, if, if you have some examples to provide. Maybe yeah. we'll start 
Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Matteo. Okay. One, one, uh, one uh, idea that we're uh, proposing right now, and in fact, discussing with our parliament or Congress, is the use of the special education fund. That fund is by law, 1% of the real property tax goes to education uh, financing, which will also uh, supplement what the national government is doing. So um, that might include, uh, as part of our conversation with the legislator, is to expand the coverage for uh, uh, the use of the special education fund. The other is that uh, we are engaging, as I mentioned earlier, with the, the private sector to their chambers of commerce to provide us with the necessary equipment for those who are disadvantaged. The other is a possibility of printing out uh, self-learning modules, um, training of our parents to be a tutor during uh, this lockdown. No? So this, those are just samples. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe Julie, if you would like to, uh, to answer that question. Okay, um, I'm not really involved in the details of the sector, but what I do know there is a lot of um, national online media sort of uh, sessions that are being ha that are happening. Also, um, even with the country with the challenges that we face in South Africa, um, nearly eight. Well, I would say nearly 100% of our population have mobile devices. So there is a lot of lessons that are being offered through uh, mobile phones, cell phones, and those kinds of online mechanisms if people don't have laptops and tablets and those kinds of devices. And, um, you know, our country is really trying to continue uh, finding various means to, to continue with the learning. The biggest challenge, I think, is uh, people are afraid that with online learning, any kind of mechanism, it's going to lead to the drop of standards and assessment. And this is not necessarily the situation. So we are having discussions around that, that it doesn't necessarily mean that there will be a drop of standards and assessment criteria, you know, for this cohort of learners. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, would you like to try to answer that question? Oh, let me just unmute you. Just one second, we can't hear you. Now? Yes, now you can. No? Okay, maybe first point, of course, I think uh, it's important that the problem of equality and vulnerability and inequality is a problem of all countries, which is very important and interesting in this COVID that, uh, for example, here in Europe, uh, the European cities, they face similar problems. Uh, of uh, access and, and know how to do the digital schooling because even or e either their teachers are very old uh, or are not uh, prepared or the students are really confused and, and not able to, to stand. So I think that's very important. Uh, the voluntary work uh, around this possibility to, to uh, um, help vulnerable students to group them to attend them more personalized this is a, i think a big field also in all cities and and that some uh, initiatives are coming up to to help vulnerable children uh, to to keep momentum to be protected and and for example uh, because they are home really uh, dedicate their time to the studies and there is, uh, there I think, uh, even uh, of course, all if there would be public budget to give facilities and to pay people to to help them is good. But gender policies again and uh, are crucial, I think, uh, and that is not a point of budget. So this is also a point of willingness and uh, transparency and of community building, which can uh, lift a little bit this point. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Mr. Munsog Jin, perhaps you would like to address the question. Um, you're muted. Let me just make sure we can hear you. Uh, I still. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, as I mentioned, in uh, our city uh, already provides the uh, uh, digital device is uh, to the students, especially low-income students 
uh, can have uh, the uh, receiving the online uh, education. And I think uh, in Korea, uh, the first uh, important thing is uh, the education. So uh, education should be continued. But anyhow, uh, so far, we cannot have uh, the face-to-face -face education. So we have to depend upon the online uh, education. The online education is uh, based on the, the distribution uh, digital device to the every uh, students. And the uh, teachers also uh, uh, should be equipped uh, by the, the digital uh, skills. But that is not enough. So we provide the 11 uh, talented uh, the teachers. So uh, teaching assistants we dispatched to the schools. Then the teaching assistants can uh, help the, the old teachers or uh, they can provide uh, the directly uh, the skills to the, the students. Uh, anyhow, uh, we reduced other budget and uh, uh, we gathered the budget to put the, the uh, education uh, support. Uh, anyhow, the first uh, the priority is uh, education. Then we can reduce the other budget and then we can uh, deduce the many uh, the events uh, budget. After then, we collected our money uh, to make uh, the online system. And uh, we will uh, set up the, uh, the online system to every uh, uh, schools. So uh, it's uh, our the, uh, policy. Uh, I don't know, the other country can uh, divide with uh, our the opinion, uh, the premise of the budget, the money. Uh, but I think uh, the priority should be based on the people's mind. And in Korea, our parents and the students focus to the, 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 uh, our uh, uh, education. And the, the big problem is uh, the uh, high school third uh, year students. Today is uh, the first day opening, uh, but uh, very, very difficult because some cases is, uh, occurred in some places. At that case, uh, the students has to go back to home. Uh, so today is uh, the reopening, but uh, uh, some schools are uh, uh, closed. Maybe it will really occur uh, continuously. But I think we have to continue our education. So for the time being, we have to set up the online system. Uh, so online and offline education should be uh, what? Uh, so that's our the duties, I think. Thank you. Um, I just so we're running a little bit of time, but uh, I I just want to ask one last question in 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 a few kind of a three tiered question. So the topic of today is new partnerships in education governance, and one of the questions that came to us is how uh, do you establish partnerships? What are the criteria for for establishing partnerships? And I think that's a really interesting one. How does a um, a government uh, determine what kind of partnerships can can take place? Um, with that question, I'd like to ask you to consider answering what the most significant demands have been in establishing these partnerships and how do you foresee uh, these partnerships in, to continue and endure in the post-COVID uh, context? And this is the question I asked to, to Julie at the end, but if you could um, maybe all speak to that particular question. And uh, so I said three-tiered question and I'll repeat it if needed, but 
um, what, uh, how does that affect the general educational system? And that's one of the questions that came to us. Does your country have to change your educational system? So this is a broader question, but uh, do you foresee this having an impact on the broader system, generally speaking? Uh, not just the COVID-19, but the, the uh, implementation of new partnerships and, and the reflection uh, that goes into, um, into aligning the new needs to, to the current system. So we'll start with Sarah, if that's okay. And I'm happy to repeat anything if needed. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, maybe I can, I'm not the, the one who can answer on the schooling itself because, um, but generally I think uh, when we talk about establishing partnership, uh, we need um, articulators and facilitators. And then we, uh, we need to, I think, make a very clear role uh, for what is public, what is private. So in the education and all the um, sites which, which, which we group under education, cultural activity, uh, child care, elderly care, community work, um, it's important uh, that local governments are in, in the center and to look a lot, uh, over the public interest in all this because of course, partnerships are very important and, and can uh, be make a kick off. I think in particular, the crisis is really a, a big opportunity for partnerships and, and everybody want to help everybody. But um, the uh, facilitating role of local governments, I think is important. And, and uh, so it's, it's, um, it's key that they are um, also count on a system so that it is clear that if you have a governance system, okay, what kind of commitment can I do for how many months, for how many years, and then the other groups, the volunteers, the private sector, what can, uh, can they do? Uh, and I think uh, there's a lot of risk as well, uh, because if you don't uh, develop policies for the partnership, uh, you can be run by partners. And, and um, so I think there is this is a point for the systems. And the new deals, um, definitely the new deals uh, uh, will involve uh, all kind of, of um, partners, but there again, I think uh, what is very important to have one really clear uh, targeted response for each territory. So you cannot have the same deal for a small um, village in Spain uh, than uh, to the city of Joburg, Johannesburg. So uh, we need to be very careful with standardizing a little bit the, the way uh, education is understood. And there are institutions that should be in charge of this. And I think UNESCO is a very important connector in this, in this as a general, um, very connected network that has to deal with education on every, on every level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe Julie, uh, if you have a few comments to, to add. Thanks, Marie. Um, I think, <clears throat> you know, a lot depends on how you define the problem. Uh, usually it would be nice, you know, when I was talking about crossing boundary practices and doing all that prep work. For any kind of planning, it would be nice to have the privilege and opportunity to plan adequately. Unfortunately, with this pandemic, we didn't have that. So, uh, you know, partnerships and regrouping and putting people together very had to be done very quickly. But Having said that, I think you have to look at the value add of, of, of you know, your partners that you bring into the, into the situation and into the structures. Um, I also think, you know, this, this whole concept of what is your site of intersecting practice? I think it's a very good notion about macro and micro needs will be very different. Uh, it enables you to look that you don't leave anybody out. So there must be a social compact. Uh, and social and political solidarity. What's interesting in our country is our political parties all banded together under our stage five lockdown. But there is a lot of posturing going on now and, you know, criticisms against the president and, you know, from the opposition party. So there is that game playing that's going on. So I think it has to, you know, really be carefully considered 
but you can really undo the mistakes you you know you make and and I, uh, I really think that civil society and community considerations must be taken into consideration. It can't just be on a high level. Thank you. I'm muted, thank you. <laughs> um, Mr. Monsyok Jin, under one minute, if you could provide your final remarks, uh, that would be great on that, on that particular question. Or yeah, it's at a very important time and uh, still, uh, COVID-19 uh, cannot be ended. Uh, so uh, we have to prepare uh, how we can uh, develop our continuing uh, education system. And uh, uh, I have uh, made uh, the uh, hotline with uh, the education bureau and the uh, uh, education uh, community, uh, especially the education direct office uh, Want to have uh, the uh, great help uh, to establish the online system, uh, and uh, we are providing the many facilities uh, to the schools, uh, including the notebook and the tablet PC and uh, uh, the internet uh, system uh, to schools and uh, to the students. Uh, of course, uh, to the students. Uh, we are providing uh, the wireless uh, the uh, apps uh, to the uh, students to receive the, the listening uh, online uh, education, and uh, we have the dialogue with uh, the, the higher position people at education and uh, the community uh, parents. Uh, it is not easy to have uh, the, uh, uh, the discussions. Uh, because of uh, the uh, social distance still, we have to keep. Uh, but we do not have any experience of uh, the lockdown. Without lockdown, we continued our society and uh, our economic situation also uh, can survive. So we are having the, the discussions uh, with uh, the parents and uh, the teachers and the experts. Of course, the chairs uh, uh, distance is the, at least two meters, and uh, we have to uh, wear the masks and uh, we divide. So it's uh, very important to have uh, the good ideas, and Thank we will you. develop uh, based on the, the ideas, uh, and uh, we can continue the new creativity, I think. Thank you so much. Uh, a few very short final remarks from Mr. Matteo, just a few seconds, and then we'll be closing this session. Where? Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, what is he talking about? That we have a um, uh, enabling environment uh, through a uh, legislation on what we call the Adapa School Program, which uh, really helps in the building of partnership. On top of that, we have a long history of partnership, uh, government engaging partnership with private sectors and non-government organizations. So uh, it's um, quite easy for us, uh, knowing that um, the, the Philippine government right now uh, is doing everything it can uh, to ensure that um, we mitigate the, the impact of the uh, pandemic, not only to basic education, but to the um, uh, overall sectors and industries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we have completely run out of time now, but this was a, a rich and interesting conversation. Um, before I pass the floor for closing remarks to uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Howells, uh, I would like to thank everybody for the really great presentations and to let everybody know today uh, that the slides that uh, were shared will be uploaded to our website, uil.unesco.org. We have a page dedicated to all of our webinars. Uh, so you can find the different uh, topics and, uh, and and maybe either you want to rewatch them or you want to find the content that was shared. That's up to you. A lot of questions today on the role of digital education and uh, lack of access to education uh, due to uh, specific circumstances. Um, we've discussed this in different webinars and we try to address the topic specifically um, 
uh, so that we, we don't digress onto other topics. And it, it can be tricky because the, some of the questions come up and, and are very much interconnected. But uh, I invite you to go and review and, and uh, watch again the webinars we've had on the digital uh, online learning or family learning, which all address some of the questions that we saw come up today uh, in the, in the Q&A. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about economic recovery. Uh, and we'll, we'll be hearing from uh, a city in Korea, Goyang. We'll be hearing, hearing from the city of Milan. Uh, we'll be hearing from the uh, COVID-19 Recovery Task Force, uh, uh, Alliance of Mayors, uh, and, and a few other participants as well. Uh, so with that, um, I, I would like to uh, now pass the floor to my colleague uh, for closing remarks. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next week. And thank you again to all the participants. Hey, thank you, Marie. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers for taking the time to, to join us and to share um, so many different insights from um, different parts of the world. It's clear from the presentations that we've heard today that more traditional forms of education governance and provision have been overhauled by the COVID-19 pandemic. Suddenly, a whole host of other stakeholders are relied upon for the continuity of education. Uh, meaning their role is more pronounced in decision making and at the point of implementation. Today we've heard about some of the new forms of partnership taking root in various countries around the world and various cities and in the next few months we'll see how a more cross-sectoral approach to governance necessitated by the pandemic uh, might change education in the long term. So thank you for joining us and we hope uh, you can join us again next week for the webinar on recovery. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.